is the case with how things really come. Now, I, I do want to say that in this world, there are churches and church systems, religious organizations that are totally unaware of these processes we've just talked about. They pretty much, you know, they'll have a bunch of people come and they'll have a pastoral selection committee and they'll, you know, say, well, I like this, you know, they'll ask a bunch of questions, say, well, I like this guy, and, you know, and they'll say, okay, you're the one, you know. And uh, a lot of that is not based on anything that we've discussed up to this point. And in fact, it probably rarely happens that way in the Lord. Uh, an example that I also think of that involves someone here was, um, oh, many years ago, uh, Jim and Carolyn moved from the colony, or they were living in the colony at the time, and, and I was the pastor, and uh, I don't think we had an assistant pastor at that time, but Jim was coming to the church, and, and he was pretty much ministering to the people, to the sheep, like an assistant pastor. I mean, he was just flowing out of him, you know, and nobody ever said, you know, go do this, go do that, go came up. And so one day I was talking with Deb and I said, you know, Jim is the assistant pastor. And she said, I know. I mean, he just does everything just, just from his heart, just like pastor would, you know. So, so I said, well, I'm going to talk to him about it. So after one of the services, I walked up and I said, Jim, I want you to think about something, pray about something. I said, but um, would you consider being the assistant pastor of the church? And uh, Jim had just come from a hard situation where he'd been the pastor of another church. He said, well, no, 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 I don't think I want to do that. I, you know, I, I don't, no, I don't think I want to do that. I just, uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm sitting there kind of a little confused. And so finally, you know, the right answer hit me. And I said, okay, okay, forget it. Forget that I said that. Jim, would you keep functioning the way that you're functioning? He said, yeah, I guess so. I said, all right. <laughs> now, does anybody see anything there? That it was, he was functioning by life, actually. He, he, he may not have even had a clue that that's what he was doing. It was just coming out of him. It came naturally. It came easily. It wasn't forced. It wasn't, oh, my God, what do I need to do next? I need to... Wait, I can't do this. I need a job description. I got to know every detail before I can do the job. Well, I, you know, I think job descriptions are good. I mean, I'm not necessarily against job descriptions. I'm against thinking that that's the, the order that's going to explain it all to you. You're going to face things, trust me, that are not the job description. You know? <laughs> There's a man who's experienced that. <laughs> But Christ meets all of those needs. He comes through. Thank God Jesus comes through. And so, for that reason, um, I really think, I mean, uh, I've said this before, but, but uh, many of the things that we call titles, like minister and elder and deacon and all that kind of stuff, you know, they're just... Back then, when they first started with them, they were just terms. I mean, the new church started, and they had some guys that, you know, after about five to ten years of the church going, um, they had some guys who were elders, and all that meant was they had been longer in this thing than the young guys. And they said, well, go talk to the elders. There was no thought of, oh, go talk to the elders. Just go talk to the guys that been around longer. You know what I mean? They got more experience. I mean, it wasn't some holy moly, oh, I'll be God in those school, go to, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, minister means servant. You know, you're just a servant. You know, you're a minister. Well, you know, I'm a minister. Oh, you, you serve everybody, huh? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's, all, that's what I do. You know, but nowadays, to be a minister, oh, sitting around people, you know, I don't know who you are, and you know, one guy cusses and everything, and then somebody says, you know, Randy's a minister. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> you know, and I say, I'm so holy, I don't even say hello, because it's got hell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, being a minister, 
may mean that you you sit down with people that don't know any better and just cuss. You know, one of the funniest things I've always enjoyed about going to Mardi Gras, standing there talking to somebody, and they are, and they find out that you're Christians out there, and they just cuss and everything, and they're trying to get some sort of reaction. You know, and I go, yeah, yeah, you know, and I just, you know, I mean, I'm not going. <gasps> said, 
Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now, at this point, Samuel's done exactly what the people did. He's looking on the oldest son. He's the oldest. And yeah, there's a there's a line and you know all that uh, the oldest. But a lot of times God removes the oldest. Okay. You, you know, God will, God will set up a set up a thing, and then He'll change it on you because He wants you to know His heart, not just have it all figured out. Well, let's say God always changes for elders, and God always does this, and God always does that, and da, 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 and you're not relating to Him. You just got a bunch of facts in your head. So He'll change it up, and you go, "Wow, wow, who can figure you out?" Well, you know, if you check with me, huh? But it's a relationship, not a gathering of facts. Mm -hmm. Alright, so, so he says, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. You know. And then uh, verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. How many of you are familiar with that scripture there that says, Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. All right, just so you know, this scripture can be applied just in general. It's a general principle. Man will always look on the outward appearance, no matter what, under any circumstances, God will always look on the heart. But this scripture is particularly used here in relationship to God's choosing. God's looking on hearts when it comes to his leadership. I don't know, man. I don't even see anybody go. That's a big deal to me. It shows me something here. It shows me that I don't care how good you are, how talented you or me are, or how what we think we know or what we think we can do. God's looking for something in the heart, and it's not abilities in the heart. It's a certain tenor of heart toward him. Okay? So developing all the abilities in the world and not having the right heart is foolishness. Amen? Amen. It's absolute foolishness to do that. But to, to cultivate a heart for God in a special way, then God looks and he goes, I can give you abilities. I can protect you. I can do this and that. But a heart like that. So here's a guy. He looks good. Everything. Samuel thinks he looks good. Everybody else thinks he looks good. You know, the words are spoken. And behold, the Lord's anointed. Surely he's before us. And God says, surely he ain't. <laughs> <laughs> and how would you know? You can't see his heart. But I know his heart, and he ain't the one. Was he bad? <laughs> Can you see Jesse? That's his oldest son. Was he bad? <laughs> Should I kill him? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, what? I mean, you know, is there something wrong with this guy? It's not that there's something wrong. Now, can you hear the Lord speaking here? It's not that there's something wrong. It's just not the right heart. I'm looking for a certain heart, not a certain countenance, and a certain ability, and a certain this or that. I'm looking for a certain heart. I remember, we, we had somebody described as looking at the body and not just, I'm just seeing a member and say, well, I'm going to minister to Rob and it's really going to be good, but I'm going to minister to Rob in relationship to the whole. Uh, and there's many, many ways that you can say, there's no way to describe that to you. I'm telling you that there's a view that is above the earth where when you do something, you're not just you as an individual doing something to somebody else as an individual. There's a whole other understanding that has filled you. How do you explain that? I can't explain that. I can only tell you that it exists. That it comes from above and it comes from the heart of the Lord. It is the heart of the Lord working in his body. Mm -hmm. Having the same care one for another. Where do you think that comes from? What I just described. You can't. You can't get that in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, think of these things. We must think of these things. We're, we're not going to develop. I mean, we are given but given on a higher level than just given to tasks. All right, so uh, 
you know, it's real hard to go ahead and leave that verse because there's so much to be said about us and the outward appearance and saying, well, he, you know, this guy's got to be the right one because his outward appearance looks good. He always does this. He always does that. He always does that. He's da 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 da. But you know what? There are Pharisees who did everything right and they rejected Jesus. He wants a heart that won't reject Jesus. In fact, he doesn't just want a heart that won't reject Jesus. He wants a heart that will love Jesus, but put Jesus first. First above what? First of, you'll never put him first out here until you put him first above you. Above your motives, your ambitions, your desires, your things, your wants. And when you begin to do that, when he can conquer you, then he can take over. Amen? All right, so verse um, 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this one. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. That's got to be freaking him out a little bit. You know, you go and you came to my house, you know, oldest, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next, and you go all the way through seven, and you go, well, he ain't here. Well, how do you know? I don't know. Apparently, I don't know. I was yelling, let's grab the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and then something begins to work in me that I just flat don't, I don't know. You know, people come to me, hey, what do we do this? I don't know. Let me pray about it. I don't know if you ever noticed, I like to pray about things, and I do pray about it. You know, somebody says, well, give me at least two, three days of spending a little bit of time with the Lord, and I'll be fine. But I don't know. I'm an idiot. I'm worse than you. I have no clue, you know, why I'm in the position I'm in. But i got to know from Him because I don't know. I mean, i got to know from Him. And if He doesn't speak, I'm in real trouble. Because I'm not going to make something up. <laughs> well, let's just, you know. <laughs> my tendency is, well, let's just don't do anything. You know, because in my early years, it was let's run out and do something. And then you not only have messed up, but you've got to clean up the mess. You know what I mean? You're not only wrong, but you got to clean up the mess from that. If you don't do something, then at least you're not having to clean up something afterwards and then go do what he wanted. You know, I just wait. It's called waiting on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. I don't know if I'm going to wait on the Lord. Well, how long are you going to wait? Until I hear. Amen. Well, how long will that be? I don't know. I'm not the one giving the answers. And I have people say stuff to me from time to time. It's like, well, you know, come on, you know. So, I'd rather look like an idiot, which I am. I'm an idiot and I don't know. Okay, just figure that from now on. I'm an idiot and I don't know. I will check with the Lord and if he tells me something, I'll tell you. If he don't tell me anything, I usually keep my mouth shut. You know? And that's why some people, you know, when they walk in the room and they can say, it's obvious he don't have anything. They walk right by me. And if they kind of see me turning over there, they go, boy, avoid him. He's heard from the Lord. <laughs> All right. And so verse uh, 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are all thy children here? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. All right, they're all in the house. They're all hanging out with Dad. And David's out in the fields keeping what? His father's sheep. We'll read another scripture in just a minute that helps really explain that. So, so let us go on. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. See? Samuel's from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> fetch him. <laughs> fetch me that pail. <laughs> fetch me my boots. What? <laughs> For we will not sit down till he come in. And he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Now look in uh, Psalm 78, and we have an explanation of these scriptures, uh, these very same scriptures in Psalm 78.
and verse 70. Psalm 78, verse 70. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. All right, notice that there is a correlation between what David was doing, how he was acting, how he was carrying himself with the sheep, and how he would carry himself with God's sheep. He was given the responsibility of a flock of little woolly sheep, some big, some, you know, ewes, uh, young, and what have you. He was given that responsibility. And later, he was given responsibility for Israel. This was his father's sheep. This was his father's sheep. Is that correct? And this was his father's sheep. This was his earthly father's sheep. And this was his heavenly father's sheep. Israel. You see that? That's what it says now. It's right there in verse 71. And so, what was happening in David? Okay, picture this. This is, the, this is the, the kid that wrote Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down. You know, this is a relationship. This is a real deal working with this kid. This kid is 17 years old, and he's sitting there... <clears throat> on the hill overlooking the sheep and he's watching them graze and he's taking care of them and he's taking care of the little ones and if they go too far he brings them back and you know one gets a bird and hurts them and he's taking care of them and he's doing all this <clears throat> and he's he's developing in him a heart from the lord for his father's sheep and he's taking care of them not because the father has a guy up on a higher hill watching him to make sure he does it as long as I'm being watched, I'm a great leader. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> but rather, he's there and he is expressing the Lord is my shepherd. Look how he takes care of me. I take care of these sheep just like the Father takes care of me. And he develops a heart for these sheep like few do because it's not the physical that he's looking at. He's living somewhere else and it's flowing down to what's down here. Can you see how that can happen? And it's just got him. It's got him. He doesn't have it. It's got him. He's not controlling it. It's controlling him. All right, so he's ministering, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want him. He maketh me to lie down and read, but he leadeth me beside the still water. He restored my soul. So he's doing all this stuff, and it's working in him, and it's working in him until there's a point where, now see, now I want you to notice two things that are going on here. One is, is that he's relating to the sheep in that way, but the other one is, he's really relating to the father. The Lord is my shepherd. This, he's not going, the Lord and his redemption is the greatest doctrine on the planet. The doctrine of redemption is there is no greater doctrine. Well, big deal. There's no greater God than my God and he's my dad. There's no greater Lord than my Lord and he's my Lord. You understand? And David is not going, you know, the Lord is my great doctrine giver. And I know all the good doctrines. I went to Bible school. No, he's, what, is, what was it that was said of David? That he was a man after God's heart. He was a man after God's heart. He's after God's heart. He's trying to know the heart of the Father. And, he's, and it's so real that he must relate according to what he's saying. So that the day comes that, that uh, Samuel steps up and he's called into the house and faces him. And the Lord says, there he is. 
There's the one. And then the scripture says, uh, took him, uh, verse 70, he chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds from following the ewes great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob his people in Israel the inheritance. And so he says, you've been faithful with that which is least. You have the right heart, the right spirit, the right view, the right relationship. So I'm going to bring you over here and now I'm going to have you really feeding my sheep. Well, David wasn't sitting here at 17 years old thinking, if I take care of these sheep, right, I'm going to be king of Israel one day. I'm sure he never thought that. I'm sure as a little 17-year-old boy said, he's not thinking of great things like that. He's thinking of, I have a great heavenly father, and he takes care of me, and I'm going to let that, I want to be just like him. You know? But we sit there in our little positions and we say, well, I'm going to be faithful with that which is least so I get more. Because it's about more. No, it's not. It's about being faithful. It's not about more. If you are faithful, more comes. But the goal is not more, the goal is faithfulness. And so, David is knowing the Lord. He's, I mean, look at this, look at this. He wrote a whole bunch of the songs. Now, the best songs I've ever heard are love songs. And you either write a, a love song to God because you love, I love the Lord, I love Jesus. Or to your woman or whatever, to your man. You know, because you love him. David is not, you know, he is not, again, he's not writing out laws or doctrines or, he's not becoming some sort of a professor. <coughs> He's sitting there writing songs to the Lord. Man, I love you. I need you. I need your help. I need your peace. I, I long for you like a deer. I long for the waters. And you know, I mean, this guy is, there, there's not a doctrinal bone in his body. The fact that he walked into that tent for the first time proves that. <laughs> Most of you know what I'm talking about. But he walked into Zion. You know, David's tabernacle. I mean, good grief, he should have been struck dead. Everybody else was struck dead with David. And once he did it, it's like the three-minute mile. Once you break it, everybody breaks. You know, everybody started coming in there. You know? But his heart, when he's just sitting there playing and singing to the Lord and you know, we have no record of David running back to the house and going, Hey, brothers! Hey, everybody, check this out! Gling, 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 gling. But, but you better believe that they probably heard his songs. Amen? You better believe they heard his songs. In fact, everybody's heard his songs. They're called the songs. But he didn't write them for, for you or me. He wrote them for, for the Lord. He loved the Lord. He, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. He didn't say, the Lord is my Savior. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord must become your shepherd. He must become your vine. He must become your way. He must become your righteousness. He must become your peace. I mean, just a few days ago, I went through something where it was, I was just jiggled in my peace. And I just went, whoa, hold it, hold it, hold it. The Lord is my peace. And I mean, let me tell you, it's not just words. And if it is just words, He won't do a thing when you need it. But it's not just words when all of a sudden you have peace because the Lord is your peace and the Lord can be shook. And you're resting in Him. Then all of a sudden everything else has to get quiet. I mean, if God don't change and you don't change, guess what? Circumstances will just have to change. 
And if they don't change, the Lord still your keys. It doesn't really affect this earth or have to affect this earth, although He came to affect this earth. And so, this reality of no thought of leadership, certainly no thought of greatness in that sense, but really, really captivated, really enraptured by this thought of knowing the Lord and of getting close to the Lord in a, in a whole different way, not in a, in, a, in a teaching way, not in a Bible school way, not in a reverend way, not in a, but, but, but in this Davidic kind of, kind of way, Davidic kind of way of, of, Lord, I just love you. Lord, I just, uh, I, I want to I take care of your sheep. It's in my heart because they're yours and I love you. Can you see something kicking in? It's called leadership. But he's unaware of it. He's not trying to develop it. He's not trying to find his niche. He's not trying to find the thing that will set him apart. He's, he's looked into the heart of the Father and he's over there disseminating the spirit that he has received. Not just doing good deeds. He is a servant of Christ. That's what a coffee cup is. It is a servant of coffee. It serves coffee. Are you serving Christ? Are you a vessel? That's serving Christ? Or are you serving Christ? You see the difference? You know, one is, I'm serving Jesus way up there, and the other one is, I'm serving Jesus. Well, what do you got there? Jesus? You pour Jesus out on people. Amen? I mean, what do you got? I don't have anything. I'm an empty vessel, except I got Jesus in me, and you pour him out on people. But you'll never pour out Jesus on anybody. If you're thinking about you and your place and your times and your situation and, and what's happened to you and what hadn't happened to you and, well, there ain't no hope because, you know, let me tell you, I mean, David had no hope sitting on that hill that somebody, that the prophet was going to show up that day. You know, he had resigned himself to serving God in this way and it pleased his heart. It was called contentment. With godliness is considered great gain, by the way. And so, God didn't just look and see a heart for him, did he? He looked and saw a heart for the sheep, too. Now, that's important. Because I have known many people who, boy, they stay in the scriptures and they search the scriptures and man, they're here and boy, they know deep stuff and they know really good stuff, but man, they don't, they're, they're almost oblivious to what's going on around them. Hello. Oblivious. And that's not the heart of the Lord. I mean, he took David from following the sheep and he put him over taking care of Israel. And if you're not faithful where he's put you, you're not going to be faithful. You know what I mean? If, if you're not faithful here, you're not going to be faithful out there. You know, if you're always, if you're sitting there and God's giving you this and you're always looking over here going, well, I don't know why I can't have that. Or I hope one day I can have that. Or, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, you know, lifting up your eyes not into the hills uh, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. It's lifting up your eyes to something that is not yours yet and may never be if you don't get your eyes off of it. See, I mean, well, I'll be happy if I get over here. You know what? If God gave you that in the condition you're at right there looking over there all the time, you still won't be happy. You won't. You think that'll make you happy. People always say that, you know. Well, if I just had a, a big house, I'd be happy. Well, if I could just go to Hawaii for a week, I'd be happy. You know? And it doesn't solve everything. Scott, Terry, y'all been to Hawaii, right? Everything solved, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you, you know, one 
once you travel as much as I have, I mean, you see a palm tree in Hawaii or Costa Rica or Jamaica or wherever, it's a palm tree. Yeah. Ocean's ocean. Really, I mean, I, I'm so, it sounds so horrible, but after a while, you just go, I've seen it. Yeah. I, bet I saw it over there, and I saw it over there, and I saw it over there. And, I, and you know, in my early days, it was like, <gasps> you know, the kid from Oak Cliff. <laughs> I'm in Jamaica, you know, and there's palm trees everywhere, and it's an island, and you're going, oh, this is great, and then, then you're there, and you realize, you know, we're, we have an orphanage, and we're taking care of little orphans that were cast out, and people didn't want them, and we've got to feed them, and we've got to get them up every morning, we've got to comb out their hair, and we've got to make sure that their sores are taken care of, and we've got to, you know, do all this stuff, and then we've got school, once we get them up and going, then all the kids from the neighborhood come in, and we teach them all day long, and then when that's done, you pass through three churches, which is what I did, and then when that's done, you go down to the poor farm, where people are dying, and you try to grab souls just before they drop off into hell, and, and uh, the stench is so bad, and the urine and everything else, and Deb went running out and threw up, and most of the people couldn't stay in the room, and God granted me the ability to stay in there. And pretty soon, you don't even notice the palm trees. <laughs> you might as well be in Oak Cliff. <laughs> you know, you might as well. I mean, it's, no, it's not a lot of different. You're not walking around, woo you know, You're walking around, seeing hearts and seeing needs and seeing people, and you, you start caring about them because Jesus cares about them. And so and then after a while, anywhere you go, you, you're not... You don't see the earth. You see above. You you see the heart of the Lord, and you see that He cares. And so you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. People, you know, wonder why. What keeps you going? It's certainly not this. This will turn on you and attack you, folks. Yeah, well. It will turn on and attack you. Guess what? Let it attack you. You just keep loving. Because that's what Jesus did. Don't you know that when he walked for three and a half years, at the end, uh, all the people he ministered to, at the end of it, he knew there wasn't going to be one person saying, No, don't crucify him. No. Do you know he knew that? In advance, he had what's called foreknowledge. He knew that every person he healed, he healed a bunch of them. Everyone he fed, he fed thousands. Everyone that he ministered to, everyone that he shared the word with, that not one of them was going to come rushing to his side. So you know what? You better have a higher motivation. You better have something working in you by that time. Because if you don't, you're going to get bitter and, you know, just walk off. You know, you're shipwrecked upon the rocks of, of what a million ships have that were Christians. And that can very easily be your, your future. Now, do you want that? And the answer is, hopefully, no, I don't want that. Well, then the answer is, is like David, you forget about all of the stuff that you think is bolstering you. It's, you know, it's the perfect example. This same David now, you know, the father says, here, you know, take some lunch. I understand that the Philistines have come out and your brothers have gone to war. And take some lunch and feed, feed your brothers. What's he doing? He's taking care of his brothers. He's feeding them like a shepherd. Now, they're looking down their nose at him. Oh, little brother, what are you doing here? Remember, he came there and Goliath out there ranting and raving and had been for 40 days, you know, and everything. And so they said, what are you doing here? Well, just, you know, my father sent me. You guys are probably hungry. I'm here. Got some good food. Just checking on you guys. How's it going? Oh, we know the naughtiness of your heart. <laughs> You're just here to watch the battle. There ain't no battle. You chickens, nobody's going out against the <laughs> Kill me, man. Yeah, thank God I wasn't there. You know what I mean? <laughs> no battle. You big sissy! <laughs> Give me that, Eliam. <laughs> well, just say, I'm going to conform to the image of Christ. <laughs> so, what is it, so, what is the thinking here? David says, we can do this thing. You little 
16-year-old twerp? Where do you get this stuff from? Oh, I have been in the presence of the living God for most of my life, meditating on His Word, dwelling in His presence, knowing Him, and I'm telling you that big boy there ain't nothing compared to God. They're going, oh, these kids nowadays. <laughs> David, in spirit, is not a kid. Not a kid. Not a kid. Don't be a kid. Don't be a kid. Be a son of God. And so, you know, they're all thinking, and finally, you know, finally they go, well, gee, we finally got somebody out of all of our whole armies, our whole nation. Nobody's wanting to go out and fight Big Boy over there. We finally got somebody. You know, this guy's a trained warrior for the Philistines. He's a giant. He's got the, the strongest and most powerful weapons. And we finally found a 17-year-old kid who'll go against him. So let's take him to Saul. So they take him to Saul. And he says, you know, I'll do it. And Saul's going, well, you know, this may not be a bad deal. I mean, if he kills Goliath, then we win. And if he loses, we say, he don't count. He's just a kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> so Saul, what does he do? I don't know. Let's give him carnal weapons. <laughs> and they put Saul's armor on this 17-year-old kid. Now Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And David was probably way shorter because he was just a kid. And he put Saul's armor on him. And, you know, the hat's down, you know, and the big old breastplate and everything. And dragging the sword, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think this is going to work. And that's the deal. We're always trying to outfit ourselves with something that we think is going to work. And that's not leadership. Mm -hmm. no. The greatest leaders have forsaken that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they've trusted in the living God. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. David goes, look, this ain't going to work. I have to use what has worked with me in the Lord. I have to use, you know, this thing, because it, he said, you know, well, one day a bear went out against the sheep, and God delivered him in my hand. The next, you know, next time a lion came out, and God delivered him. And so he said, so Goliath will be the same. So I'll just use the same thing. I'm in tune with the Lord in this way. I, I know the Lord in this way. My heart has been to protect the sheep. So this is, and he said, this Goliath will be no different than the lion and the bear. Can you see the real relationship? Now, come on. Forget the teaching and all this. I've mean, only got a few minutes here. Come on. A real relationship. There are many Goliaths out there, and you're going to face them. They're real. And you are going to be like everybody else. Unless you know the Lord and have a relationship with the Lord and are caring about His body, not just about how you look in that body, like Saul did, or like the people did about Saul, or like Samuel did about Eliab. No, it begins to be this thing where you say, you, and you have to do this. Something in you kicks in. It's not the anointing came upon me. In fact, if you notice where we read in Samuel, it says, this is the one. This is the one who's been watching the sheep when you compare it with this one too. He's been watching the sheep. He's been relating to me. I've been a shepherd. Da, 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 da. There's this long-term relationship already been going on. And so I'm going to put him in this relationship over all of Israel and everything. And he says, so anoint him. The anointing didn't come upon him and make him bad. That was something worked in him. Something kicks in and you say, I'm a servant. I, this is not about what's going to happen with me. This is about others. This is about them knowing the Lord. This is about them getting through. This is about them being taken care of. And you begin to forget the earth. And you begin to be an agent of his life to others. And you know what? I want to just tell you this. 
And it's not necessarily described to you as, ye shall be a pastor in Beaumont, Texas. You know, I mean, I, you know, we want to hear something like that. Probably not Beaumont. We want to hear Hanamimu <laughs> or whatever it is. Waikiki, yeah, there it is. You should be a beach pastor in Waikiki. <laughs> You know, and if and if that's in your heart, that probably ain't God. <laughs> but you know what? The one who doesn't care probably gets to go to Waikiki. <laughs> See, because here's our way. This is our little sneaky mode. But okay, I'll act like I don't care. <laughs> but for so long that God will be convinced. It's called holding your breath. <laughs> you know, like God's really fooled. Oh, I didn't know that you've been lying to me all these years. <laughs> no, he knows. He knows your heart. And so, what, so something, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm telling you, something begins to work in you, and you really don't care about you. You really care about him, and then you care about what he cares about. And, you know, the Lord gave me a picture once, and I, I wrote it out. I probably never read it here. It'd be nice if I had it around here, but I don't. And it, and it basically was a picture like this. See if I can remember this. I was sitting in a church building and on the pews, and I was just out in the congregation, and there was singing and offerings and things going on. And all of a sudden, I was caught up in the spirit, and I entered into a heavenly realm where there was beauty all around and it was indescribable because it wasn't like the earth. But, but my mind tried to grasp it based on the earth. Blue like so-and-so. Blue like so-and-so. Different things. And so, um, and, and then as I began to adjust to all of that, I turned and I saw Jesus. And my heart went out to the Lamb of God as I began to love Him and to worship Him. And an immediate response, not just to beauty, not just an awe of beauty or of whatever, but a connection to the Lamb and to His heart. And that began to happen. And and as I was entering into that oneness and that adoration and worship that comes with that, suddenly I noticed something that I had not noticed before. And that was his face. And his face, he was not, he was not looking at me. He was looking at one particular place. And there was an incredible look of joy, an incredible look on his face. And and at that moment, to see this one that I love, I wanted to see what it was that he was looking at that caused him to, to look that way, the way that he looked in his face. And so I turned and I looked, and I saw New Jerusalem. I saw the bride of Christ. I saw living stones. I saw an array of living stones that had been brought together as one temple. They were polished and burnished and, and made bright and beautiful, and yet there was um, a, a loss of each individual for this beautiful temple, this city, this bride of Christ, this one that he loved. And I looked at her, and then I looked back at his face, and basically from there, I was, I saw the Zion of his heart, and then I was translated back to the pew, and I was in a service, and I was hearing singing, and I was seeing offerings taken, and this and that, and I, something in me screamed, this is not it. This is not it. 
the thing that most deeply affected me was this look that was on his face as he looked at the bride. In the church. The bride. The incredible look that I was so busy at first worshiping him and I was almost caught up in my worship of the Lamb and oh the Lamb, what the Lamb means to me and oh what, how beautiful and oh the things that you've done in my life and oh the things that you've done for me and that I almost missed his face and what he was looking at. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, it's like I, I left a concept inside of me of loving and worshiping, and I looked at Jesus. And I, and I looked at his face, and all of a sudden I realized there is something huge going on in him. And I want to see what it is that can move him like that. And, and when I looked, I saw, I saw what he, I saw that he doesn't just care about my personal worship. He cares about his bride. He cares about his body. He cares about the church. He cares about others. The first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbors, you see. And all the commandments are fulfilled in this one. And so I realized that my worship and my life was incomplete until I had set about to bring about that Zion of his heart. That everything that I had done with ministerially, oh, I'll adjust this. And, I mean, you see what I mean? I mean, you know what, I'll pay money for this mic stand. I'll, you know, all those things were great, but they fell so short of that face and going, oh my God, this is what I must give myself to. <laughs> This is this is this will not fade. You know, this will fade. That look, that desire that is in him will not fade, and I must give myself to bring that about. And so that comes at a great loss to yourself. That comes at a great um, sacrifice. It's not really so great. But I mean, we, you know, it's almost not a sacrifice. But in terms of, if you stop for a moment and look around you, and you go, you know, I really don't have anything. I don't have anything. I don't really, I just, you know. I mean, I mean, if you say, well, do you have a career or whatever? Well, you know, you can say you're a pastor or whatever, but where are you going? Well, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm trying to build the kingdom of God. <laughs> you know, I mean, does this make sense to anybody? I, I, this comes so deep from within me, from what I have seen of him, and, I, and it broke me from this me and Jesus worship thing to almost like, oh, I'm the bride. I love you to seeing the, the bride, which is not me, it's us. But it's, you understand? But, and, and seeing that he wasn't interested in me just kind of going, oh, no, no, that, that if I truly was one with him, if I truly felt his heartbeat and was on this pulse and really with him, then I would be in the field with him, working with him to bring it out what he wanted. And then I could, and having known that, and that was a vision, but that, Vision didn't do it. It was the spirit of the understanding of that that affected me. Do you understand that? It wasn't the vision. It's the spirit of the understanding of I didn't recognize him. I didn't see his face. I was so busy with my thing with him that I didn't see. And when I saw it, I went, this is it. I can never do anything else. I will spend my life doing this right here. Father, we just thank you for this time where we are, Lord, not examining how to become great leaders or whatever. We're examining your heart. And Lord, I believe that you will mightily use those who have forsaken their plans, who have forsaken 
their ambition, to have forsaken their wants and needs, and they have given all. Lord, they've just taken it all and added it all up. And they've bet it all on you, Lord. They've just counted the cost and said, Jesus, you're worth everything. You, there is no cost to me. You are the treasure. Lord, many of us still hold on to things. We treasure them. But the only reason why we do that is we have not yet, and this is what we're asking you, Lord, we have not yet really seen the spirit of what I described in that vision. Not, the, not that we haven't seen that vision. We haven't seen the spirit of that like David saw it, where he was simply taking care of what was the Father's that was in his heart. Lord, there must be a seeing before we are called into it. Like David, the calling came much later after he'd been walking. Lord, help us to see beyond the earth, beyond positions, beyond titles. Help us to see ministry in a whole new light. And help us to pursue the heart of Jesus with all that is within us. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.